In the past, we've talked about the various schools of Rhea Lucaria, as well as Celia, Town of Sorcery, and we've analyzed the various sorceries that have come from each conspectus. However, there are a number of these spells much older than the Academy itself, and sorcerers who likely came well before those who study behind its walls. In fact, there are sorcerers that don't even originate from the lands between, having come from the very stars themselves. These sorcerers have a distinct look to them, as they don't resemble your typical humanoid figure found in the lands between, and their sorcery takes on a different color from the light and dark blues we know to come from Glintstone. Today we are going to discuss the Onyx and Alabaster Lords, the originators of gravity sorceries in the lands between, and the influence they had on the world as a whole since their arrival on a meteor long ago. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Elden Lore. If this is your first time checking out this series, welcome. On behalf of the team at Square Table Gaming, thank you for checking out our content. With over 100 lore dives under our belt and in our playlist, we're confident we can answer any lingering questions you have about the lands between. But if you don't see what you're looking for, just let us know, and we'll look into it for you. If you end up enjoying this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It goes a long way in helping us stay relevant in YouTube's algorithm, and we'd really appreciate it. We also have a Discord, where you can talk to other FromSoft fans about your favorite Elden Ring lore and theories. On top of that, you can find a link to our 50k subscriber giveaway in the description below. Winners will be chosen on April 23rd, so try your luck. With that said, thanks for checking us out. Now let's get back to the story at hand. The Onyx and Alabaster Lords could be seen as somewhat of an anomaly in the Lands Between. But then again, they're not the only creatures we know of that originate from the stars, simply the only humanoid ones. As far as their history is concerned, the only concrete answer as to their origins that we have comes from the Alabaster and Onyx Lord Swords. The Alabaster Lord Sword tells us it is a great sword forged from a blue-white meteoric ore. The blade conceals gravity manipulating magic, a weapon unique to the Alabaster Lords, a race of ancients with skin of stone who were said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. And the Onyx Lord Sword is described as a great sword forged from golden-hued meteoric ore. The blade conceals gravity manipulating magic, a weapon unique to the Onyx Lords, a race of ancients with skin of stone who were said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. From this we gather that due to their very similar appearance and the fact that they share their affinity for gravity sorcery, the Onyx and Alabaster Lords are simply two variations of the same race of people. Their names only allude to their actual skin color and nothing more. But it is interesting to note that the Onyx Lord's sword has the ability to repel enemies, while the Alabaster Lord's sword draws them in, perhaps indicating some form of difference between how the two use their gravity sorceries. The title of Lord is an interesting one for these creatures to have, as they seem to hold no land of their own, having fallen from the stars and essentially being outsiders in the lands between. But it would seem that they were given this moniker due to their strength, as we learn from the sorcery, Meteorite. One of the glintstone sorceries that manipulates gravitational forces summons a void that emits a rain of small meteors. The sorcery originates from the Onyx Lords, who had skin of stone, and were called lords in reverential fear of their destructive power. It would seem at the time of their arrival, as they showed the fierce potential of their mastery of gravity, those that encountered them deemed them lords as a way of appealing to them, granting them a title in order to show respect for their capabilities. Perhaps they were even seen as lords of the domain that existed just overhead, the very stars themselves. Given what we know of their origins and their affinity for gravity sorcery, we think it's fair to assume that these lords arrived in the Lands Between alongside Estelle and other falling star beasts, and knew of the danger these creatures posed to any planet they found their way to. From what we can tell, the falling star beasts are likely the originators of gravity sorceries, as the most powerful gravity spells stem from Estelle itself, and each variation of this beast utilizes purple gravity sorcery in combat. To bolster this idea, a lesser Onyx Lord is found walking out of a portal as we make our way through the Yulu Annex Tunnel, where Estelle, 
Stars of Darkness has been locked away. We believe this lord acts as a warden of sorts, to both keep Estelle in check and keep those seeking its power away from the celestial beast. Interestingly, the placement of the Alabaster and Onyx lords across the land almost always tells a clear story. The most likely place we first encounter an Alabaster lord is in Rea Lucaria Academy, while exploring the area outside of the classrooms. Upon walking up to a large structure, a portal opens and a fearsome opponent steps out. At this point, newer players are likely to have no idea what gravity sorceries even are, so it's easy to be caught off guard by his ability to pull us in. This lord may have taken up residence at the academy simply to share his knowledge with scholars who would seek it, and while we don't have a conspectus dedicated to purple glintstone, we do know it exists in the form of the meteorite staff and there are plenty of stones of various shapes and colors being studied within the walls of Rey Lucaria. Another Onyx Lord can be found by making our way through the sealed tunnel, on our way to the Divine Tower of West Altus. We believe this Lord may have been placed here by General Radon, or possibly asked to protect this spot by another member of the Karian royal family. I make this assumption due to the fact that this particular Divine Tower is where we unlock the power of Rikard, Lord of Blasphemy's Great Rune. If anyone intended to seal away the ability for this rune to be properly utilized, we think it would be Radon, who would want to make sure his brother's power could never be used against him. When it comes to how Radon held enough sway over the Alabaster Lords to request this, we'll get to that in a moment. There's an Alabaster Lord that can be encountered in South Limgrave, but he's not simply waiting there for someone to find him. When we stumble across the area, there are these strange hooded people wielding scythes and chanting. We learn what they are called from the gravity stone fan and chunks. The desperate ones which scavenge for these shards dub themselves star callers. It's possible to come across these enemies in the Altus Plateau, where upon getting too close to them, they're able to summon a falling star beast. And when we encounter them in Limgrave, they're able to summon an alabaster lord. We're unsure if the Lord and the Beast are heeding the calls of these fanatics, or if the Starcallers are simply tapping into powers they don't fully understand, but either way, they clearly have a way of connecting to beings associated with the stars themselves. Perhaps it has something to do with those strange poses we can see them performing. There is another Alabaster Lord that can be fought in the Lake of Rot in order to obtain the Alabaster Lord's sword, and if I'm being honest, I have no idea why this Lord would be here. They should have no interest in the power of Rot, and there's no piece of lore tying this enemy to this location, not even an assumption that could be made as to who would encourage them to be here. It's a complete mystery to me, but let me know if you have any idea why we find him here in the comments. Lastly, we have the Alabaster Lord who I believe had the most impact on the lands between, not through his own actions necessarily, but those of his disciple. In the Royal Grave Everjail, to the east of Caria Manor, we face an Alabaster Lord. He's been locked away in this place, and like many others we find trapped in Everjails, we believe this is for good reason. I theorize this Lord was locked away by Ronnie the Witch herself, for the crime of teaching Radon what he needed to know to hold back the stars. The first question you may have is, how could Ronnie know that Radon holding back the stars was the key to her scheme? After all, we learned this information ourselves in her service. Ronnie would know better than anyone that the fate of the Karian royal family is dictated by the stars, and that if the stars were being held in place, clearly she could not take the next step in attaining her goals. I believe Ronnie knew all along that defeating Radon would unlock the way to Nokrin, but she had Blythe searching for another way in, so that she would not have to kill her brother. It's in Ronnie's nature to withhold the truths she deems unfit for others to know, and one of my biggest reasons for believing this to be the case is that even if we do not enter Ronnie's service, when we eventually make our way to the Radon Festival, Blythe is there, waiting to do battle with the Star Scourge himself. Our involvement as a vassal of Ronnie simply confirms a truth she already knew, that her brother needed to die in order for her to achieve her goals, and we bring that to light amongst her advisors. 
All this is to say that it is feasible that the Alabaster Lord we fight in this Everjail is the very one who acted as Radon's teacher in Celia, town of sorcery. Through sorceries like Gravity Well and Rock Sling, we learn that these gravitational techniques were studied by the young Radon, and that his master was an alabaster lord with skin of stone. Once he completed his training by learning collapsing stars, Radon even told his master, I thank you for your tutelage, for now I can challenge the stars. We know what Radon's master was, an alabaster lord who showed the young star scourge everything he needed to know to halt the stars in the sky and prevent calamity from reaching the lands between, as it did long ago, when Estelle fell to the land. It's fair to assume the motivations of the Alabaster and Onyx lords were actually noble. They seemed to want to prevent anyone from disturbing Estelle, and willingly shared the secrets of their incredibly unique gravity sorceries in order for Radon to prevent any other stars from falling to the surface. However, this could have been wholly selfish on their part. These creatures were lucky enough to fall in the lands between, where their power is revered enough for them to be considered lords. Perhaps they didn't want any of the other races across the cosmos to find their way here as well, and threaten their station. Whether you believe their intentions good or not, there's no arguing the significant impact the Alabaster and Onyx lords have had on the history of the lands between, even if so few now remain, and they hide in the shadows of their gravity portals until disturbed by those who would threaten their secrets, or call upon them directly. Thank you for joining us for our lore dive into the Alabaster and Onyx Lords. Where do you believe they came from before their species rode the meteors to the lands between? Do they have a home planet? Or did they simply come into being due to whatever organic material the meteors brought with them? How exactly are they tied to Estelle and the Falling Star Beasts? Do you believe the Alabaster Lord locked away in the Everjail outside of Caria Manor is Radon's teacher? Why in the Elden Beast's name is there an Alabaster Lord in the Lake of Rod? Let us know your thoughts and theories in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and set notifications to all so you never miss out on any of our lore dives. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore.